So I, I guess we'll get uh, started. I don't know if these have been uh, starting on time or late. Um, it's really, really interesting for me to be here. And uh, I'm hoping that you guys will get a, a little bit of enjoyment out of uh, a little bit of where you know, the road started, um, where you know, everyone I think in the room here and, and the people that have grown Cloud Foundry to what it is today, which is an amazing uh, feat. And then I'm also going to talk a little bit about where I think things are going. Um, sometimes I get those things right. Usually I get the timing wrong. But uh, I'm happy to share what I see as, as coming in the next kind of wave and where things are in what I call the, the technology chaos soup that we're in right now. So the future is easy. Um, naming things is hard and timing things is hard, right? Um, believe it or not, Cloud Foundry, um, at least as it started, is uh, nearing seven years old. Right? And I think I was talking to Abby and uh, Chip coming in, and she said there's about 1,600 and some people here uh, at the conference, which is pretty amazing. Um, a, a bit about me, uh, moved out here in 1990, um, did a lot of work at TIPCO, which is a vendor here, uh, designed and architected all their high-speed messaging systems um, for about 12 years. Um, I was at Google for about six uh, I created and architected Cloud Foundry, at least the very beginning, nothing that what it looks like uh, today. Um, and I did that while I was at uh, VMware. And so we'll kind of go down a little bit of a trip on, on how things got started and, and some fun facts and such. So one of the, the interesting things coming out of Google um, was the motivation for uh, what was termed Project B29 at the beginning. And I'll explain why it was called that. But at Google, not only was distributed systems and all that stuff that I had thought I knew at TIBCO kind of turned on its head, right? We were in the full swing of web as an application framework, right? Not just static pages. Gmail was born kind of when I was at Google. And it started this massive revolution that moved into uh, mobile and now it's going to go to IoT, where everything can be an endpoint for visualizing, collecting data, interacting with things. But what was interesting was is that when we first got into that wave, and this will, will date myself very quickly, I remember the notion of you know, just deploying and distributing software was, what zip level did I have to use to get my software on one floppy? Yes, I, I am old. Um, but that's what it was, right? And that's all I cared about. I didn't want two floppies, I wanted one. And web development all of a sudden was very, very hard. And midway through my, my time at Google, things like Ruby on Rails came out, and Django, and all these things trying to make it easier. And they did, and they made it tremendously easy to do those things, like have a very opinionated framework to kind of scaffold out a web page with a little web server all on your laptop. When you tried to transition that to something that people would call production, things got really kind of difficult. And although when I was at Google, I wasn't involved in Google App Engine, I was noticing that and Heroku. Right? And I was noticing a couple things. One, it's a serious problem. Right? How do you deploy these things faster? Right? Ruby on Rails, Django, other frameworks, um, I think Spring, Spring Boot type stuff nowadays, makes it easy to develop it. But deploying it, at least at the time, was hard. And at the time, uh, when I was entering my sixth year at Google, um, Paul Moritz was asked to take over uh, VMware. And he came calling mostly for Mark Lukowski. Um, but a little bit around me as well. And he says, hey, you should join VMware. And I said, why would I do that? Um, he says, because I just want you to do something cool, which was funny, because that's how I got hired at Google. That was my job description, just do something cool. And so I thought about it for a while, and I actually decided to join VMware because of Paul. And Mark Lukowski and the guy that I worked with um, very closely at Google, Vadim Spivak, went over there. And Mark Lukowski, if you don't know, is, is very uh, famous uh, for lots of things. Um, but the, the one that really should resonate is, is he was one of the core developers on Windows NT, which kind of sets the tone for modern APIs. And he also had a project in Microsoft called Hailstorm. So when we got to VMware, he wanted to recreate Hailstorm. So he kind of went off and did that. Um, what I did was I sat down um, and started thinking about how could we actually take something like Heroku um, maybe a little bit like Google App Engine, although Google App Engine was so opinionated, didn't have databases, didn't have anything, and bring it to the enterprise and adopt things that the enterprise might like. Uh, you know, a relational database, Java, right, at the time. 
and so that was my pitch to Steve Herod and Paul Moritz. I said, hey, I want to go and build a pass for the enterprise. And he said, what's a pass, right? And I started pointing to Heroku and pointing to um, Makara, which turned into OpenShift, believe it or not, uh, when Red Hat bought that. Um, and so we started then starting on the path of um, designing Project B29. Now, B29 is interesting because the name actually comes from Mark. That was his one contribution in the early days. Uh, in Microsoft, all the secret projects were named after buildings where the project was actually being housed. VMware's campus in Palo Alto does not have a building 29, but we just thought that was kind of a, an interesting kind of play on stuff, and that's how that kind of came about. But again, I mentioned that it's almost seven years old now, at least from the original thing, and again, it's, it's gone through an amazing journey. Uh, but it started in October of 2009. Uh, it took me about two days to design what we presented um, to Paul and, and Steve and uh, Todd. And it was originally Vadim and I coding. Um, it took about three months for the first prototype that was actually running um, to show to Paul and Steve. Now, what was interesting about this was um, th this, this architecture, which actually Redeem actually is the one that actually uh, took this from my notes in, in the uh, two-day design, um, looks probably radically different than the people in core Cloud Foundry world these days, and then might look you know, relatively uh, um, familiar. Right? There's a notion of an intent state. You know, what are you trying to do? Well, I'm trying to run this thing. Um, and of course, that's the, the cloud controllers. And then the health manager was saying, well, I'm going to match you know, what's really going on with what the intent is and try to fix things up right, if, they, if they skew. Um, the, uh, and apologies, this is why the, the talk's called Naming Things Are Hard. I'm the worst at it. The droplet execution agent, or DEA, which I know is, is almost gone. I think it's on life support, right, to be replaced by Diego. Um, and then we had the notion of services. And the, and the idea was that I pitched to Paul, because he, when he said, what's a pass, I said, all developers care about are apps and services. They don't care about machines, virtual machines, memory, CPU, or anything like that. And so services and, and, and such, uh, in addition to the droplets that would be running, which were the apps, were the key components. Um, and again, this is, you know, my, my drawing is very, very bad, and it's getting worse. Um, but Vadim actually drew this uh, at first. Um, and so this is some of the early days. So what was really interesting was that at the time, VMware didn't know what to do with the notion of open sourcing something. They really didn't. And so we had talked about this thing called GitHub, and we were doing stuff on Dropbox, and, and I had pushed uh, along with Mark, um, and Steve Herod also supported it, to open source whatever this thing was going to be called. Right? Again, it was called uh, B29 to start out with. And um, one of the interesting side effects about that was that when we actually made the decision, the lawyer says, well, all of the history up till now, we got to get rid of that. We don't know what's in there. We're afraid you're going to you know, do something bad to the community from just the comments in GitHub. And they also said, and oh, by the way, we're going to have a private repo. And then the lawyers are going to watch everything in the private repo and then bless it to get you know, transposed to the public repo. And this is, you know, 2009, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, so the, the video actually is kind of interesting, too. So this is the only, I think, artifact from the original code base. And you kind of see, I did a lot of work remotely from home, so that's why you see two of my heads flying around. But if you watch it in slow-mo, you'll see a lot of things that still have, have an influence on what actually exists today. And I think when I watch this, I, I, I feel, you know, pushing the, the envelope with VMware to open source it was the right thing. Um, I think starting projects, lots of good projects start with a small amount of people. Um, what makes them great, though, is the ecosystem that develops around it and the team that actually drives that ecosystem. So, you know, a huge hats off to, um, you know, the people at Pivotal and all of the partners, you know, IBM, SAP, I'm sure I'm missing lots of them that have driven this ecosystem to what it is, because it's pretty amazing. And that has nothing to do with me. I was just the one that kind of started twiddling bits early on. Um, and so, you know, if you have time, look at this. It's pretty uh, interesting from a historical perspective. Some fun facts, um, or some myths, as I call them. We were not part of Spring Source, right? So Chris Richardson had a small project that was an automation 
framework for AWS that Rod Johnson liked, and he bought Chris's company about three months before Paul Moritz bought Rod's company. Um, we had joined myself, Mark, and Vadim about three months prior to that transaction. And so Java was not the, the first uh, language that I implemented in the, in the DEA. The first one was Ruby, because I picked uh, Ruby to, to, to write it in originally, and I, again, I apologize for that. Um, just make sure we're on the same page. I still actually really like Ruby to tinker around. It's just not a production language, right? There's too many dependencies. We were struggling with figuring out how to update it, and that plus the, the virtual machine infrastructure provisioning was the kickoff for the meeting in Palm Springs that created Bosch, which was a design by Mark, myself, and, and Vadim. Um, DEA was named by me at 2 a.m. We were getting really, really tired. We were joking that clouds make droplets, so why don't we call it a droplet execution agent? And I'm sure somebody from marketing, by the way, we had no marketing, um, would change it. And it's still probably uh, around in some form or fashion to today. Vadim is a lot younger than I am. And, and I'm going to show a picture. And you might have seen this picture from the Wired photo shoot where I'm on one end and Vadim, who's six foot eight, is on the other end. Um, he loves Java. And so he started coding in Java after we got the original design done. And he was on the cloud controller, and I was on the scheduling algorithm, DEA, the router, and such. Um, and I was outpacing him. And it wasn't, trust me, from, from any um, talent of mine. It was just Ruby. You can get a lot, a lot of stuff done faster than uh, Java. Um, but if you ever run into Vadim, uh, he's, he's an amazing person to, to know. And uh, he works for. Um, Stellar that does kind of online uh, storytelling uh, on iPhone and Android. Um, but he got so frustrated that he went home, learned Ruby, because he didn't even know it, learned it on a Saturday, figured out what he was going to do on Sunday, and by Monday afternoon he had rewritten everything, and then he was blowing by me at, at light speeds. Um, he also was the engineering manager on uh, the original Bosch implementation. Good, good guy. I think this is, this is dead correct that it's the first open source project ever from VMware. Um, now, uh, Pivotal, obviously, with the foundation, has actually in, embraced that. It's totally transparent, right? But again, we had shadow repos to start out, but it was worth the, the time. Um, and the original CLI was named VMC, and it was actually written by Oleg, who actually worked with Vadim building Bosch as well. And we're lucky enough to have him with us uh, at Upsera. Some more fun facts. The first customer was actually Salesforce. And so what was interesting is we actually met with Benioff. And what Benioff was describing, and actually Parker was describing, was very interesting to me. It was the notion of a SaaS ecosystem that had advanced so far that they had to allow their customers to write full-fledged applications. Right? So think about this. You have a website first. You have some of the customer's data. Then you have APIs. Right? Then you have service APIs. Then you have a scripting language called Apex. And that still wasn't enough for some of their more advanced customers. Yet what they didn't want to do is have someone, say me, I'll pick on myself, write an application, deploy it on Amazon, not monitor it, it falls over, and then me blame Salesforce for it. And so VMforce was born to essentially allow a landing spot for these applications that were purposely built, written in Java, to consume service and data APIs for Salesforce and the force.com platform. I think Benioff liked it so much, um, but he really did not like the notion of sharing revenue with Paul and VMware. So at one point, we got a call about 8 o'clock at night, and Paul calls me and he goes, hey, Mark wants to talk in the morning. What's up? He goes, is the system up? And I, I had the whole system running on Rackspace on my own credit card. I had a monitoring system on it, and I was looking at it. I'm like, no, it's up. It's fine. I don't know what's going on. Well, what was going on was is that he didn't want to share revenue, so the next morning he announced that they bought Heroku, uh, which was pretty interesting. Um, RabbitMQ, um, I actually uh, proposed the, 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 the buying of, of um, the parent company for RabbitMQ and Alexis Richardson into VMware, because RabbitMQ was actually selected as the first messaging backplane. I'm a messaging guy from the TIPCO days. Um, but it's interesting, and I think you're seeing a trend now where these new microservices type systems, enterprise messaging systems, might not actually be the best fit for them. And there was things that I think, to be honest, I didn't understand about Rabbit, what it was trying to do. But its general sense was that it was trying to bend over backwards to do something that it thought the client app, which was the original B29 code base, was trying to do. And it kept locking the system up. 
So I got frustrated with that and I created Nats, if anyone knows what that is. And that was, uh, I had played with some code and I had some Ruby code written around and I, I wrote it in a weekend and swapped out Rabbit and, and put Nats in. Um, the first app was not Java or Spring, I said it was Ruby. It wasn't a Ruby on Rails app either, it was just a Sinatra app. And that's how I got introduced to Blake Miserani, um, who, who created Sinatra earlier on. Um, when Rod Johnson and Spring came into the fold, right, Paul quickly pointed out that the number one citizen for um, AppCloud, by the way, was our first choice for the name. Uh, so he says, you gotta stop calling it Project B29, we're not at Microsoft anymore. Um, for AppCloud, he says, has to be Spring, right? It has to be Java and Spring and all this other stuff. And as we were getting close to launch, we did a, a, a kind of a video launch of it that I think is still on, on YouTube somewhere. Um, the last weekend before the launch, I, I tried to pick the coolest two things at the time that I thought the, for lack of a better word, cool kids would like, and it was Node.js and MongoDB. So I slapped those two things in less than four days before we launched. Um, and it was really interesting because we could track how, which you know, languages were being used, which services were being used, and they actually did really, really well. Um, monitoring app was also built last minute, um, which wasn't uh, too fun. Uh, it was kind of a, oops, we better actually do something about this. And that's kind of what it looked like. And there's still pictures online somewhere. Our first marketing person was actually Jerry Chen. And Jerry and I are standing at some conference somewhere, and that thing's in the background. Um, it was very simple. It would just monitor, you know, the state of things. And, and those things that were black would turn bright red if anything was wrong. And so that time when um, Mark Benioff called Paul and was asking about, you know, was, you know, what's wrong with the system, that's what I was looking at. I'm like, nothing's wrong with the system. It's fine. Uh, it was the business model that was off by a little bit. This is the Wired Photo in 2011. And this was kind of, we had just launched, and this was kind of like a coming out party about, I think, if I recall correctly, three or four months after we had launched, Wired wanted to do a, a, um, an article about us. And what you see there is Jerry's not there. Um, Jerry had brought in James Waters to kind of drive marketing in the ecosystem. And I think uh, all of us can agree he's done an amazing job at that. I mean, look at all of us kind of sitting around here. Uh, but Mark Lakofsky's next to James. Vadim, again, six foot eight, so on the end. Um, Patrick Bowman, I think uh, his name was, uh, was next to Mark. Um, I can't remember the guy, the other guy's name. I'm bad at names, great with faces. Yeah, yeah. Um, good guy. He's at Facebook, I believe, now. Um, so, good, good stuff. And this was already two years after we had started the original code base. So, it's amazing how fast things feel like they're going, and then when you actually look back in the rearview mirror, it takes a while for these things to kind of develop. And we'll talk about how, what, what else has been developing in, in just a second. So what we got right, and uh, I had a lot of fear and loathing in Sunnyvale about this talk, so I, I will term it what I think I got right, but I might be wrong. Um, it was about apps and services, not VMs and machines. I think that still resonates very well. Reduce the OpEx spend and speed up deployment, right? There's a tremendous amount of, of dollars being spent in trying to deploy these applications, and I think Cloud Foundry and all the success stories I've been seeing on Twitter and, and such, um, kind of prove that that has really kind of been uh, an amazing success story there. Um, the distributed systems architecture, I think there's lots of changes that go on there, but I think for the most part it did well. I think in the launch video I launched 100 node apps in nine seconds or something like that, which was good. Um, run on any infrastructure. This seems kind of obvious now, but I can promise you I was not a very popular person inside of VMware when I said that to the principal engineer council. Um, they did not like me whatsoever. Um, I think it's the, the right decision, and I think what we see now is a lot of Cloud Foundry deployments, whether they're um, on-premise, on OpenStack, or VMware, vSphere, but also on Amazon, uh, I think Azure now, and I'm sure Google if it's not already running there. And so I think we got that right, but wow, that was painful uh, early on. Uh, I got beat up a lot. Um, I thought in general, and I don't know if it's still true, but the notion of stem cells, we had this notion of there's one base image and it had kind of everything it needed to be anything, a DEA, a cloud controller, or a router, or whatever, and we could just send it a message saying, hey, we want you to be this, right? And then, of course, the open source, which we've, we've talked about. So, again, fear and loathing in Sunnyvale, what I got wrong. Um, Ruby as an implementation language. Uh, again, I like Ruby. I like Matt's. He's a good friend of mine. Um, but for production systems, 
Um, it's really nice when deployment is more of a copy, right, an SCP versus a run these chef scripts or pick your flavor of the month to get all the dependencies are actually in place for you. Um, at the time, I did layer seven ingress only for the router. Um, that's HTTP. Um, I again know that Cloud Foundry's added uh, layer four. And I think that's more of this notion that it started out as apps and in services. But what I didn't say is at least in the original thought process of putting the system together, most services would run outside. And if you look at some of the original Cloud Foundry, there's no way for you to deploy like a MySQL database, but they were there and they were available through the services system, right? The services, gateways and such. Um, but that meant that most of the applications we were gonna deploy would be web apps, so I only did layer seven. I think layer four within Cloud Foundry is, and I'll talk about it in a second, kind of where the future things are going, where these platforms are now ingesting a lot of the services. They're not meant to only live on the outside, right? And then you need to go to TCP and sometimes UDP, um, obviously for like SIP and things like that. Um, I think Justin uh, Smith gave a keynote here, um, amazing security guy. Um, I didn't think hard enough about security and trust in the early systems. Um, that's what actually kind of spurred the creation of Absera, the company that I, I work for now. Um, I, I had bought into the too opinionated thing to get things sped up. And this could be very controversial, right? But I believe that people are willing to give up their opinions if they can get something that they can't feel they can get anywhere else or anyhow else. But I think when you can give them what they want and give them their opinion back, you see things like Docker, right? Docker is the only opinion that cares is what the developer's trying to do with stuffing everything under the sun into a two gig Docker image that takes 20 minutes to download, right? But it's there, right? And it's, it's, it's part of our, our presence and our, and our future. And then this is the other uh, controversial one. I don't think it's bad that Bosch is open source today, but at the time, you gotta realize the environment I was in. We had designed it for Vadim and a team, which again was him and Oleg, essentially, to both build it and run it to deploy these, these installations for us. VMware customers are used to looking at vCenter and clicking buttons. Bosch didn't have any buttons, didn't have any GUI stuff, right? It was all CLI stuff. And I think it was amazingly well designed and implemented by Vadim and, and Oleg. But my fear was at the time when I said, I don't think we should open source it was, is that the audience who can actually use it for what it's um, good at would be fairly small. And the lesson that I tried to bring and, and whether it was right or wrong was the same one I learned at TIPCO. So at TIPCO, I designed a messaging system. I said, this thing could do anything you want and it is blazingly fast. And after about a year on Wall Street, I realized that it's kind of like a, a very sharp you know, chef knife. If you give it to a chef, they can do amazing things. You give it to someone like me, I'll chop my fingers off. Right? And Wall Street was doing that with these early messaging systems. They'd be sitting there writing programs going, for I equals zero, I less than a million, I plus plus, send a message. And they'd run it. And they'd go, that couldn't have been right, and they'd run it again. And they go, run it again. And all of a sudden their phone would ring, and the network ops would call them and say, you just blew out every single one of our routers. Well, what are you doing? Stop that. Um, and so I was taking that position on, on Bosch. Um, but again, I think I was wrong on that. I think it's a good thing. And I heard the Bosch um, sessions were very, very well attended. So what you all got right. Um, and again, this is where I think great projects are more about the second half lifetime than the first. Right? It's about the great ecosystem, the independent and powerful foundation, along with uh, the different um, company aspects and, and interests from like the IBM and SAP and of course Pivotal. Um, the developer tooling is amazing. And uh, in that video, I don't know if you saw, um, Romney Vasan was in there and he kind of came in, was one of the first people to say, we need to just plug this directly into Eclipse. And I said, why would you want to do that? Right? And it was just me not understanding the power of what that, that would bring. Um, as of the last probably year and a half, two years, uh, the Spring Boot and, and Netflix model and doubling down on that ecosystem and what that means I think has been incredibly beneficial to, to everyone. And then of course the microservices cloud native mantra, which um, you, know, you can call it SOA 3.0, you can call it you know, Graph, uh, graph Systems uh, 10.0. Um, but I think what's interesting, and, and we're gonna get into this just in a second, is we're kind of at that tipping point now where it makes sense. 
Before, it didn't make a lot of sense because if you took one thing and you made it 10, it actually made my job harder and it took me longer to get things done, right? I think that's gone away. That's all great, but where do we go from here? So again, PaaS started, you know, well, B29 slash Cloud Foundry started nine years ago. Heroku was even a little bit before that. Um, they're almost in the 10th the year of PaaS. But we have these things like Docker, right, and Kubernetes, and Mesos. And we don't have just Puppet and Chef anymore. We got Ansible and Salt and all these other different things. Um, and so we've got to figure out a way, in my opinion, to make sense of the chaos. And it's not just me looking at the ecosystems and seeing chaos. It's customers struggling with which decisions to make. Not all the time, but it has been for like the last three or four years, especially with PaaS kind of coming up. And I don't know if you guys remember this, saying, oh, it's going to you know, solve world hunger. And this is the normal thing. Every technology goes to this. It's the greatest thing since sliced bread, trough of disillusionment. Oh my gosh, what's it actually good for type stuff, right? So we had PaaS back to IS++. Then all this thing called Docker came out of nowhere, which it actually came out of dot .cloud. That was how Solomon actually provisioned a lot of his early past, which was also in the scene with Cloud Foundry and, and uh, Makara, which again turned into the OpenShift. And so there's just a lot of stuff. I've got Cloud Native, we've got Bear OSs, which I know sounds weird, but there is a lot of deployment methodologies that I see on a daily basis, which is give me a Bear OS and give me a chef script and I'll figure out how to produce something that's runnable for you. Obviously, the web apps, now IoT apps, the you know, mobile apps, complex, .NET, VMs, IoT, big data. Um, continuous integration and deployment, in my opinion, is going to go through a renaissance probably at the end of this year. Um, maybe not. Again, I'm really, really crappy at timing. But uh, I think the time is now where we're going to see a, a surge of, of how we actually go through the CICD process. Config management, right? We've got. Um, you know, HashiCorp and Mitchell's company coming on with Nomad and Vagrant and all kinds of stuff that are, are gaining a lot of, of momentum. And again, this notion of Kubernetes coming out um, and gaining a lot of momentum. The question I think we all should ask is why? You know, why did that do that? And of course, we've got, you know, uh, underneath the covers, which is a little bit grayed out, but it's probably down to the big three on cloud platforms. I don't think that'll be the same big three in five years. I know that's probably not a popular decision either, or, or opinion, but I do believe that. Um, you know, we've got OpenStack, VMware, and some other things, and, and bare metal is going to come back into to Vogue. Um, by the way, if you if you look ten years out, what's going to be interesting is everybody thinks everything's going from hardware to software, virtualized, and everything's going from the edges into a public cloud. Now, I'm old enough that everything goes like this. So probably in about two years, we're going to go the other direction. So everything's going to move to the edges, and we're going to drive things into hardware. And I think. The only reason I'd say that without everyone laughing at me is because of the, the big news around uh, AlphaGo was actually mostly run, not trained, but run all in ASICs, not even FPGAs. So um, interesting stuff on the hardware side, too. But from my perspective, when you look at all those chaos, it's not that I don't want less choices. I actually think choices are good. But I think we have inconsistent interfaces, boundaries, and we lack trust across how we would put these these technologies together. And so, at least for me, I look at what are the buckets of technologies. Um, and I have three buckets. Uh, I always oversimplify things. It helps me think through things. I believe there's a bucket for infrastructure provisioning, one for workload orchestration, and one for artifact to workload. Now, what's interesting is, is that workload orchestration before PaaS didn't really exist because it was part of infrastructure provisioning. You provisioned the infrastructure, you got a machine, that's what your workload was. We had no idea what was beyond that. PaaS kind of brought that in and kind of made it kind of all in one, but now all of a sudden Kubernetes is starting to say, hey, maybe there's a difference between artifact to workload, which is give me something and I'll create something that's runnable. And it doesn't have to be a singleton, it can be you know, a, a system of workloads versus actually deploying those out, stitching them all together from networking, trust, policy perspective, and running them. And at least for me, I apply the 80-20 rule. And the 80-20 rule is, is take any technology and say, what is the 80% use case benefit to me, the customer, me, the end user? Not the person that wrote it or the vendor or, or anything like that. 
And when you do that, I think you start to see some, some natural alignment into those buckets. And the only reason I bring that up is because I think that then defines where we want to look at the opportunities for standardized interfaces, standardized boundaries. And so standardization for me of uh, these interfaces is crucial for the ecosystem at large. Um, and I think, again, maybe not popular, but I don't think verti verticalization will, will succeed. I think it'll fail because we need that specialization. Um, I don't think fewer options are better. I want more options. I just want a way to kind of, for lack of a better word, Lego brick those things together. I want this and I want this and I know how they plug together. Um, I don't think vendors should have to implement the complete stack. Again, if you take that 80-20 rule, I think that you should concentrate on exactly what you're good at and have fringe 20% benefits, um, left, left and right, depending on where you sit in the spectrum. Um, and again, the interoperability is, is key, at least from my perspective. Um, so I think I, I'm going to echo, and, and Sam Ramji and I have talked about this, and I think I've had discussions with others from the Cloud Foundry Foundation around um, an open cloud ecosystem, right? How do we actually define something that everyone can get behind um, and, and actually make sense of? And I think from my perspective, it's, it's centered around uh, about six things. Could be 12, could be two, I don't know. These are just my kind of um, assessing the, the ecosystems, watching all the technologies and being involved with, with them and the customers. So an intent description. I want to run this app connected to these three services. I want you to run an SLA, so I have 10 of these in Amazon, right? We have to figure out a way to standardize that so it actually makes sense. Right now, we have uh, 15 different ways to kind of do that. Container runtimes, right? The OCI, I think, has been doing a great job. Not only on that, but they've um, picked up on the workload image formats as well now, too, right? Which means that someone who does artifact to workload will produce something that anyone can run if they want to. I think that's incredibly powerful doesn't mean that you have to pick that option, but I do believe it is incredibly powerful. Orchestration and deployment, how you actually orchestrate and deploy these intents. What's the standard interface for that? Um, obviously, storage and network, blocking and tackling stuff for uh, CNI and things like that. And then for, for me, one of my events is policy and governance. And the only reason that I mention that is not because it's a fun, sexy word. It's actually the exact opposite. But when I was at Google, I felt like I was empowered to do anything I wanted to do, and that Google trusted me. Google didn't trust me. Google could care less about what I was doing. Google trusted the Borg. And at the time, the Borg was extremely fundamentary, uh, a fundamental. It just had gotten off of the previous system. And all it knew how to do was, I'll try to do what you say, unless you monkey with searching ads. And if you do that, I'm going to bonk you on the head, and you're going to lose. That was it. But Google trusted that rule. And so then I felt empowered to kind of do whatever I wanted to. I think that notion of these, these boundaries and these consistent interfaces allow you to Lego brick things together also has to breed in this notion of how do we trust that system. So for me, it's, it's time to kind of work together from an ecosystem perspective. Again, maybe not the most popular thing to say, but I do believe uh, that's kind of where we all want to go because I believe there is a specific benefit to has style deployment of applications. I do believe there's a benefit to leave me alone, let me pack everything I want to inside of Docker. I do believe that I should be able to make those choices and make another choice on how those things are being deployed and orchestrated and even provisioned from an infrastructure uh, perspective. So thank you. Hopefully that was helpful uh, and, and useful and uh, hopefully a little bit enjoyable. Um, I don't think we have time for any Q&A, um, but I will hang around and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have. <laughs>